Welcome to today's episode of Women on Top. An engineer and MBA graduate by qualification, Malika Sadani is the founder and CEO of the Moms Co, India's leading company for toxin-free products catering to expectant and new mothers seeking natural chemical-free products for their daily personal care regimen. The idea for the Moms Co came to her in 2012 when she had just moved back to India from London. At the time, she couldn't find safe products for her daughters locally. In fact, one of her daughters also suffered from a skin condition, which made high quality solutions a necessity. She spoke to a number of parents only to realize that there was a gap in the market for products that mothers could trust, and the concern wasn't hers alone. This birthed a brand in 2016, which now serves over 1 million moms across 15,000 bin codes. In a short span, she has received several awards, including the Times She Unlimited Entrepreneur Awards and Business World's 40 Under 40, amongst others. While the product range in itself has also been recognized at the Cosmopolitan Beauty Awards, the Mother and Baby Awards, Mums Awards, and yet others. Malika, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you for having me. So first off, heartiest congratulations on uh, selling the mom code to my glam. It's a fantastic achievement considering you only launched the business, uh, what, five years ago. Um, so, you know, what do you attribute this astronomical success to? And, you know, can you in particular take us through some of the challenges you faced? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, yes, we're all excited that the mom's go with the current deal as well. Uh, I think, you know, when we got into this deal, very clear for us that we were looking at uh, distribution and what we got from MyGlam was both an online and offline distribution, right? So we had about four other uh, term sheets on the table and what was most exciting for us with them was just the fact that, you know, we are a D2C brand. We've always been online and they kind of gave us distribution across both online and offline platforms with them. We suddenly got an access to over 35,000 uh, retail outlets and a reach of almost over 100 million moms, right? That was the most exciting uh, part of the journey for us. Um, and to answer your question on what got us here, I think it's always been for us a lot of focus on brand and product. We've always ensured that the product that we create is the, is the safest, best. And that's what we've always focused on as a brand. And that's what the brand got this lot of love for. Yeah? I think, uh, you know, the brand just became a trustworthy name across different households. And that's what kind of got us more and more which is mom and baby it's a very word of mouth driven segment mm -hmm. just one person gets you a lot more consumers and that's i think what's kind of helped accelerate the growth for the mom's company you know i mean you're absolutely right and i think uh, just drawing a parallel with my own in business which is hospitality i mean then nothing beats word of mouth um you know the sort of user-based um uh, you know uh, um, support and the, the endorsement nothing can kind of beat that uh, but it's just interesting I mean just going back to the point about um, what made you pick my glam and you mentioned about uh, being now uh, not just an online e-commerce brand but also moving to the on offline space um, it's interesting because I think in the last year we've seen this crazy acceleration towards um, the digital, uh, you know, to, towards e-commerce. And so it's interesting that you also now uh, feel the need to have, um, you know, an offline presence, which you haven't had so far. So is that sort of a, a you know, a change in sort of strategy for you to now be uh, offline as well as online? Did you think that you were kind of missing out on some clientele by not being um, in, in the offline space? So, uh, Gauri, to just to add, right, like so when we started, uh, and this was about four and a half years back, and immediately in about three to four months of our starting the brand, we realized that it was very hard to find a pregnant woman online, right? And the way the brand would get built would only be through a strong connect with the mother. And that strong connect needed physical presence, which is where what we had done pre-COVID was that we had tied up with leading maternity chains like Fortis La Femme, Cloud9, Max Healthcare, Apollo, Apollo uh, the yeah. units, right? The mom and baby hospitals. And inside the hospitals, we had set up a kiosk where we would have our own, um, you know, we used to call her a mom counselor, who would stay there and get the product to be tried with a lot of women who were waiting for their chance to see the gynecs and doctors, right? So through right. that whole mode, 
we try to reach out to them and also introduce the brand to them. So we've always had some form of physical presence for ourselves. I think once COVID hit, this model stopped working because the whole concept of waiting room for pregnant women and all sort of went for a toss, right? It was not happening anymore and nobody wanted to try products during that time. Mm -hmm. And that's when we decided that we'll start our retail journey. So I've, even as on date, we have about 1,500 touch points on retail that we currently have. And from there, what we're looking at is looking to expand. And also on a broader note, India is a very uh, retail heavy market. Online is a new space that's growing, but a large part of the Indian consumer is, is on through retail, right? And if you want to be a leading player in any brand or any segment, it is important that you have retail presence as well. I actually strongly believe that only channel is the way to go and everybody will have to have some presence online and offline both for the brand to really reach a really good height for itself. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think people still have that need to kind of see the product, um, you know, touch, feel, and and uh, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. No, I was in the mall the other day and I realized the footfalls in the malls is insane. Like we walked in and walked out and saying that, you know, it seems like COVID doesn't exist anymore. It just sort of gave you that kind of a yeah. feeling. It was a little overwhelming to see so many people on the, the stores and we kind of visiting the retail outlets. Absolutely. So uh, again, I just want to kind of um, uh, pick your brains a little bit on this. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that you had four other offers on the table, and uh, you decided to go with my glam for the, you know, for the reasons you mentioned. But um, can you sort of take us through that process of how you kind of did that, you know, uh, you, you came, you went about that elimination process. I mean, like you said, the the, the reach that you're getting now um, was, was a big factor, but were there any other things, especially when it came to, uh, you know, connecting with, um, you know, the, the investor uh, parties and, you know, just how you sort of made that decision um, uh, other than of course, on a valuation and reach perspective? So I think you know, the most important uh, factor in every deal and every time you get an investor is how closely you're the investors and your point of view and your alignment is there on the future goals. Uh, the alignment on future goals in terms of growth prospects and everything was the maximum with the Good Glam Group. And when we spoke to Darpan, we were very, very aligned on how our goals matched, how the, you know, the journeys kind of matched, right? Like we have all DTC brands have always been led by 2x growth, 3x growth, year on year and all of that, which is not traditionally what you see with a lot of FMCG companies, right? They're very different modes. Uh, here we got that. And I think, as I said before, Gaurit, the most important thing that we did when we were getting into the fundraising process was that we were very, very clear that we want huge amount of distribution. And that for us was a deal break, deal uh, maker for us, which was came from the good level. Right. But you were actually uh, looking to raise another round and then decided to merge. So uh, was that a slight change in, uh, in, in strategy that happened uh, because, you know, the deal was like too good to be true? It was, I, I think what happened was we went ahead to raise funds, but even on when we were looking to raise funds, we were looking to raise funds from a strategic partner. We weren't really very keen on a financial partner right. for this round. Uh, like, because obviously, as I said, right, the most important thing that we wanted from this deal was distribution and that came that would have only come through a strategic partner. And while it was that we were very clear that we would go on an investment mode that was very clearly defined to paths to control. In this case as well, of course, it was exactly the same thing happened where there's a path to control in an uh, entire conversation. And I strongly believe that every time you get a strategic on board, you must have this route to complete exit slash path to control. Otherwise, you know, then you get into this space where uh, you have money from one strategic partner and then you kind of, everybody else is a little cautious while investing because there's already someone else on the board, right? The board mm -hmm. dynamics is extremely important to manage. And that's what we did. So it was always supposed to be a deal with a strategic partner with high amount of distribution with a path to control in mind for sure. Interesting. So uh, just talking about the whole beauty and personal care um, segment, you know, uh, D2C brands in this in this category have been growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, and they've been attracting capital, you know, from risk investors. In fact, I think this segment has attracted three times more funding in 2021 compared to 2019 and 2020. Um, what do you think is the reason for this level of interest in this specific industry, considering the COVID backdrop, um, you know, and, and everything else that obviously has mushroomed in the last 18 months? 
Yeah. So I think, as you said, right, the segment was attracting a lot of capital and that that's why it was also one of the best times for us to kind of go through and do this deal. But on a different note, I think what's happened, Gauri, which is very interesting is over the last one and a half years, we have seen the Indian consumer make its journey into skincare. Uh, you know, we were traditionally been a market which has been very driven by using a face wash and a face cream. Mm -hmm. And that's about it, right? For us, in our regime, serums got introduced, face mist got introduced. You had care for different skin types that got introduced. You know, there were conversations not just on the type of skincare and the amount of skincare that you can have, but there were also conversations around different ingredients for different benefits that came up. So I think just the entire conversation on skincare and looking after yourself was highly accentuated during the period of COVID. And what we also saw very interestingly in COVID was that the consumers changed their mindset from buying and getting products that were good for them and also good for the environment, which became very, very important for the consumer. Digital brands were slightly ahead of the curve than anyone else in these modes because when we launched, we launched with conversations around toxin-free, PETA certified, cruelty-free, you know, like going ahead and showing how we reduce our carbon footprints and plastic, you know, plastic footprint that we create during this. And that's what I think the consumer kind of associated with. And what we could do very quickly was, of course, we were very, very thorough on the space for digital. So when a consumer was looking for products online, we all knew how to make sure that we were visible mm -hmm. because we had done this for almost about three to four years. And that kind of gave a push to all the brands that it started about four to five years back. And last year, we all saw a big bump because suddenly all the consumers that you could only reach through a mode of TV or otherwise suddenly started shopping online, right? We didn't really need the re retail presence to show growth in numbers. The same consumer moved online. And that's why you sort of saw a bump up in most of the numbers for most of the people at that point of time. So can you give me an idea of what the sales mix is between uh, offline and online and pre-COVID and, and like now? So pre-COVID, we had about 98% that was just from online and about 2% that came from offline, which is strictly our hospital network and hospital channels. Um, currently, we're about 85% online and 15% offline. Wow, oh, that's interesting. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you mentioned earlier that you already had this really strong presence online and, you know, you knew how to do the e-commerce part of it. Um, take us through that a little bit more. Like, you know, is this all just about, uh, uh, you know, digital marketing and spending on, um, you know, performance marketing or is there more sort of more to it? So in terms of what you do is there are two things that you largely spend money on. One is on the performance marketing, which is on getting like the business for the day. And the other thing that you do is for brand marketing, right? Which is where you're spending money for long-term brand building and building brands trust and brand listing. Because eventually in the long run, if you're, once your product reaches someone's house, you have to make sure that the experience is absolutely wow for the person to reach. And while you're constantly working on metrics of conversion and converting consumers who have seen you, there is always a more that you have to do on increasing your top funnel, which we say is the broader awareness search funnels, which is there, right? So you broadly invest in these two buckets one from a perspective of just driving awareness and the other from conversions and trials and sales in general right and um you know i mean uh just sort of coming to your you, you as an entrepreneur um how is it managing motherhood and building this uh incredible you know homegrown personal care label so take us through how you balanced uh um you know life as a mother and an entrepreneur i don't think I think there is any balance and I think I just I think the, the best thing that I learned was I don't try and balance it at all that was my biggest learning so I'll give you a perspective right like when I started there was a point in time when I, when I just started traveling every time I would come back home I would come back home with gifts for my daughters and you know um, and I would just keep doing that constantly because it was this mom guilt that we all are aware of and, uh, you know, then my husband Mohan just sat me down one day and said that, what are you doing? Like, you're going to be traveling and doing this for a very long period of time. You can't be coming back home with goodies for children, children believing this is normal. So you have to stop doing that. And I just sort of stopped doing that. And uh, I went through this phase where I spoke to this brilliant woman who told me that, you know, I want you to write down five things why you believe you're a good mom. Hmm. And none of those five things for me, you know, came across as being available for the moment. It was all about long-term things that I wanted them to do. And that was when I made a promise to myself saying that anything important, I will always be around for you to do that. 
but at any given point of time i will not be constantly available to be a helicopter mom around you and i made my um and i kind of lived up to work not just one fine day you know my daughter was roaming around and i just got an award from somewhere and she's held the award it was a big big poster kind of a thing you know like a full layout and she was holding it right next to her and she was walking around and i said what is this she says this is my dress and i have named it and i i call it pride and that is when it just stuck me saying that you know i may not be there to do every homework with her but i am teaching her some really important life lessons and that is when i made my peace with it and that is when i said it's all right like i need to be around for important events i haven't missed a single recital i may have ran into school to attend it and see it and ran out of school uh, as soon as the recital finished been the first parent out but i have never missed their any appearance that they have made uh, never missed a ptm and that, those were the things that i kind of set for myself saying this is non negotiable at the same point of time I've, you know like it's it's really funny i've done a i've done a fundraise conversation where i got into the fundraise because it was the day of my daughter's birthday and i called the balloon guy saying that you haven't showed up please show up i walked into the fundraise conversation came out and i said where is the cake and showed up at her birthday party so i've done even that as crazy stuff and i've also cancelled meeting saying that you know mara has a recital and i need to attend that as well so i've done both spaces for it but i think it's at the end of the day it's all about finding your peace and finding your balance because there is going to be no such thing as a perfect balance i i couldn't agree with you more on that and uh, it took me a while as well but once i i found that uh, you know i made peace with it myself uh, it was a whole different uh, experience being being a working mother so i i couldn't agree with you more but um also tell me you know i've 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 read about uh, you know you talk about your uh, the, the life hacks that you employed um when the whole work from home uh, scenario came up in our lives so tell tell us a little bit about that as well So you know, as I said, as my my daughters are ten and seven right now, and they've seen me doing this from like the last five years. So they were five and three when I started. Um, I, I think they've just gotten used to the concept of workspace. Mm-hmm. And what I did even when COVID hit was set a separate workspace for myself, which was which they knew that while you were there, they wouldn't come and intervene, right? So there have of course been moments when they come in and they go out whenever they have some work, but they know that this is the time allocated for work, and Mama needs to work. and that kind of helps you set a balance and the second thing that i constantly believe on is massively in terms of scheduling and setting up routines for everyone right i think it just sort of helps the entire ecosystem if the routines for everyone is built so the children have their own routine when they go to school come back they have something they have an event to do in the evening and they come back and do that which is the same thing for me as well right when i'm available over the weekend there are some routines that we always follow and that kind of helps everyone align around what you're looking to do um and i think it's very very important sometimes to have some really honest conversations with everyone around you you know at home and also at work because it just sets premise for everybody to work more easily with each other right so i think um the biggest thing that a founder gets to do is to do it all and as and when your size of your company increases it's it's a little bit work from your kitty that keeps going on because you don't have the time to do it all and you physically cannot do it all because the scale of the business is such way you can't and that's when someone and i think it's a very similar journey to what a mom also makes when she starts going back to work right where little by little you have to learn to let go and someone else take it on for you and that i think is a very important journey that every woman entrepreneur or of every working woman needs to make for herself like learn the art of slowly letting go and someone else take control over that and that could be your child or that could be your employee or it could be a subordinate it could be anybody else but just the art of letting go and someone else take control of that i think is the most important thing that we all need to learn i'm and i'm going to add to that because i think it's what it's letting go is the first step but allowing being prepared for someone to make mistakes uh, to yeah. you know they get it right is is yeah. the is the thing which you know i think as a one of those sort of i'm i'm one of those crazy perfectionists and it would drive me mad but i think that was the biggest thing i could do was just um you know allowing people to make give them the space to make mistakes and uh, and and learn um so yeah i i, I completely resonates with me so continuing on this personal note i know that you um 
you know, you 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 co-founded this business with your husband, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, um, you know he's an equal business partner in in this venture. And uh, I I work with my husband too, and um, I know what that's been all about. So t- tell us uh, about your journey, about you know uh, um, working with your spouse, and you know is it about work all the time as a result? So you know I I have genuinely really enjoyed working with my husband. You know I think. Uh, um, you know, there's, there was, I remember there was this when we used to just it's about five years back that we were fundraising. Things have really changed in the last five years in the funding space as well. But when we started, we used to be asked questions around how we were going to make it work. Of course, when you would sign contracts, there were contractual agreements mentioned saying if you guys separate, then what happens to the business and who takes rights, right? And we have signed all those That's documents. So interesting. As well. Yeah, yeah. But I think the most important and the interesting part is that uh, when you start any company, it is very important that the partner that you choose is someone you can really trust upon, right? And that trust just lets you do a lot more at any given point of time. Like if you say, if I could have done whatever I did in five years, um, you know, without him around, absolutely not. Right, because because I knew there was certain thing that he was taking care of and would be taking care of well, just because of the amount of trust that you share for your co-founder. That's very important for anybody else, whether it's a husband, wife, couple, or anyone else. Uh, I think the only thing that we have to learn and be okay with is that every conversation gets carried at home, right? And everybody in the team needs to really know what you are doing and what your partner is going to be doing. I remember when we hired our entire layer of top team, there was this one fine day when the HR walked up to me and said that, listen, I need to have a conversation. I don't know how to do it, but I really need to get it done. So I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah, we are not sure what to come to you for and what to go to Mohit for, right? And it's been a couple of instances and we've told Mohit, but Mohit hasn't told you. And we've told you and you have not told Mohit. And I just went back to them and had a very honest chat. And I really urge people who want to do this well to have honest chats with their teams, right? Where she, I just told her, say, listen, Mohit and I don't take decisions at home. Mm-hmm. You know, and the day we start taking decisions at home and coming back and letting you know, I wouldn't have any one of you on the top team available to me, right? Because the whole idea is that for us, if I have hired you, I want to take the decision with you. And I don't want to take it at home with him, right? So please assume that we work independently and each one of our team members, these are the people who reported to me and these are the people who reported to Mohit. These are the factors where he has the veto and this is the factors where I have the veto. So I think just clearly demarcating roles for the two of us and just sort of making that clarity given to like the entire team is the most important thing. And once you sort of do that, you find ways around on solving everything. We just started off with a whiteboard in our bedroom. <laughs> that stayed for almost two years. So we used just to wake up to so much task list for what you have to do. And from there, of course, moved it out. The first thing we did once our funding rounds came in was move that whiteboard out. That's that's a nice uh, symbol of, of uh, I guess, taking the work out of the uh, out of the bedroom. And, and also, I think, you know, it really does require a conscious effort to not uh, bring work home. And uh, it, it, it really is just about being mindful of it till it becomes... Um, I, I don't think it ever happened for us. We bought work home. So if you ever want to get to know anything about the mom's company, the girls are the best to tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> like it is successfully made its route to dinner tables and other conversations all around, right? So, but I think it was okay. Like they learned through their way. Like it was very interesting, right? Like even the kids, the more exposure that they've had is that there was one fine day I put my daughter in an animators club. She sent me a logo for what she's going to launch when she grows up. And that logo had some detailing where there was a brand name, there was a tag for the brand name and all of it. And she came and explained it to me as how the mom school has that mom school and love without compromise. And this is what it is for her, right? And wow. that's the detail to which they have sort of picked up from online, you know, for our conversation that Mohit and I have been doing. But that's all right. It's a different yeah. skill that we have learned. And I think we've sort of made peace with the fact saying that, you know, the work's never going to end. Uh, it's just what we definitely make it a point is when we go for holidays, the four hours of work are separate and the rest of the time we don't talk about work, but that's restricted to those holidays that we take. But listen, it sounds like it's been such an incredible journey and, uh, you know, over such a short span of time, but tell me a couple of the real big challenges that you faced, um, you know, building this. There were lots of challenges. A lot, I think just sort of don't get spoken about enough, but I think, uh, you know, the times when the, it was the hardest was when we were starting up uh, because just convincing people to work with you was really hard. You have no background in what you're looking to build. 
um, you know, I'm an engineer and MBA by education. I have not done cosmetology, right? So what makes people believe that you will be able to make something big out of it? So it was very hard to convince people there. Um, there's constantly learning as a curve. And that's something that I've enjoyed the most in my entrepreneurial journey, where you're constantly learning. You just, there is no single day when you don't learn five different things, right? Like you're constantly learning. But that means that you have to be constantly on it to learn. Because when you go back to work, you're giving answers to people. But when you come back home, you're constantly speaking to five different people to learn from their experiences and their learnings that they've had, right? So I think there's a lot of work that goes into it. And the third very, very hard thing that we faced was hiring people. You know, it, it, you always want to hire the best, but you always don't have the money to hire the best at every stage for yourself, right? So how do you sort of strike a right balance between what is it that your payroll allows you to pay plus who's the best candidate at that point of time? And then just convincing people to join your vision and your mission is, is it's hard. It's not easy. I think as you grow in size, all of this, uh, changes in terms of what challenges every scale of business has. But I think initially when you start up, these are the three most important challenges that you face. Interesting. So what's next for you? You know, I mean, uh, is it, is it, are you looking at, at uh, sort of continuing to grow the business with, um, with MyGlam or uh, have you got some new exciting venture on the, on the horizon? You know, so I've taken a very interesting target of taking the moms to 500 crores in the next Two years. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, for the next two years, uh, sort of working with the MyGlam team to kind of make moms go one of the top leading mom and baby brands in the country. And, and maybe take it global? Yes, yes. So we've already launched in about five countries. Uh, we're, of course, taking it further with them. We're in the process of doing a lot more other launches um, along with them. So, of course, it will be globally available as well. Malika, any message to give to brands starting out in this industry or setting up their own business? Yeah, I think just sort of focus on the product. Like a lot of people kind of take short chain into not getting their product right. And it's really important that you get your product right because the consumer has so many options today that they're very unforgiving. So I think, you know, it's very important that you strike the right chord with your consumer at the right time by launching the right product and getting the right product market fix and when you do that i think you should all be uh, kind of sorted for it and i always tell everybody you know if there is something that keeps you up at night maybe it's truly worth losing your sleep over so just get up get started and get moving and you'll figure a way out to make it work that's fantastic and uh, yes i completely agree with you integrity in in you know the product and your vision is, is will 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 take you a long way um, look, it's, it's, I'm so, you know, I, I'm not in this industry, but I'm really proud of what you've done. And, uh, you know, I, I know we've never met, but I just think it's incredible that there's something, uh, you know, something so sort of uh, um, uh, special coming out of India. And, and I love the fact that, you know, homegrown brands are, um, you know, are now going global. And uh, I, I really wish you all the very best. And, you know, I, I hope to see you go even bigger places than, than you have so far. So thank you. Thank um, you so much. That's so sweet. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and, and look forward to meeting in person soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.